Well, I do have a great guest with me tonight. I have Craig Thompson, Canine CT, and he was licensed back in 1967. He holds an extra class license. Uh, graduated from Bradley University back in 1974 with his BS in Electronic Engineering Technology. Plus, he did some graduate work in uh, <laughs> business and communications. And there he is operating from the college station. Whoa. <laughs> Love the curtains. Uh, he's also an avid contester and DXer. He's uh, actually operating from Navassa right there inside the lighthouse. Uh, he has been on eight D expeditions and co-led three of them. He is also the co-leader of the upcoming D expedition to Palmyra Island, uh, which is next month. Uh, he, and that's number nine on Club Log's Most Wanted right now. Uh, he lives near us. He's about two hours south and west of us in Peoria. And he has a small farm real close to his home QTH where he has a super station, a contest station. Um, he's also president of Thompson Electronics and he's an avid runner. He's ran in seven marathons. Craig, you're a busy guy. Well, thanks. Uh, <laughs> good evening. <laughs> Sounds, I guess, pretty busy. Maybe I ought to slow down a you little bit. You are. <laughs> I even skipped out a lot of the highlights. I mean, you have a lot of, uh, you know, the DX honor roll and the DX challenge. I mean, um, and you're pretty much contesting almost every weekend. And when you don't, it seems like you're running. But how'd you actually get started in amateur radio? Let's start there. Well, of course, when most of the people my age were growing up, the face were, uh, I think technology and math and science as everybody and uh, I jumped right on that bandwagon uh, I enjoyed of course all of my relatives had old radios and I could sit and listen to the DX uh, the foreign broadcast stations and I discovered ham radio by listening and uh, studied the code on my own and found a, a lady in the na neighboring village that was able to mentor me and uh, actually gave me my first ham radio test and uh, of course I, when I went to Bradley, I kind of majored in ham radio. I, it didn't say that there, but uh, that's where I really learned a lot about contesting and DXing, and I made a lot of great friends with uh, ham radio operators that are still my friends to this day. And uh, so that that's where it kind of started. All right, now, All right. you have the Superstation. People can kind of see it in the background there. Um, let's talk about your contest station. Now, how many towers do you have at your contest station? And I think we have a slide for that, Brian. Well, um, I had uh, 11 towers, and I just added another one this year. Um, when I first started, I wanted a station that uh, I wanted enough room, you know, to get to be able to spread it out to avoid uh, interstation isolation. If you look in the back, uh, this property runs north south. It's uh, rectangular, and at the far north is the 160 antenna. And actually, as you get closer, uh, on the left, you'll see, uh, on the far left, you'll see two 200-foot towers, and those are the 40-meter stack and the 20-meter stack, and then the near stack uh, is the 15-meter uh, the stack. And then next to the shack is a 10-meter stack, and then it's all, and there's two stepper DB42s that we use for multiplier antennas, and then there's VHF antennas and a moon bounce array to the right. And the, the, the tower that I just put up is to the left, and uh, that's a monster that I had at my house that I moved over. That's a monster IR. And uh, that actually helped quite a bit this year uh, in the last uh, CQ World, couple of CQ Worldwide contests uh, working to the south. I also, because it, I can adjust the tower, I added it so it helped me with domestic contests. This is actually a picture right here of what the station looks like when we're doing multi two. and. Uh, Actually, that's uh, Ryan KB9OWD from Wisconsin, KU5B uh, uh, from uh, Texas, Houston, Texas. And I, I, I can't see all of the other. Actually, the, the, the one at the very end is a guest operator. Uh, he was the president of, of the Bradley uh, Hammond Club. We, we had him come out and uh, try contesting. And here we are doing a, a contest. Uh, Ralph K9ZO is to his back. But you can kind of see what the station lineup is. It's all identical K3s and Alpha 87As. and uh, uh, with filters and everything all lined up. So, uh, and we try to make sure that you're, this is actually the, the uh, VHF and UHF portion of the station where you can sit and work from six to 1296. And then you'll see the lunar link amplifiers above them uh, for uh, high power. Um, then I also have an EME station sitting that I'm actually sitting at right now as I talk to you. Um, 
And again, you can see that we spent a lot of time uh, we're making it ergonomically friendly. And uh, yeah, you, you don't see the whole shack from those pictures, but there's a bunk room and there's a kitchen and a, a break room and, a, and, a, and an area that where we can fix things and things like that. So when I'm here uh, during the weekend working on the station. So there's always something to do here. Always looking forward to the next thing that might make a difference in a contest. So I know, so, now I know you also, in addition to contesting, love to to uh, go on D expeditions. You've been on eight so far, it looks like, and you've co-led three. Um, and here's a slide. I think I have a slide of all your D expeditions. And if they have the gold star, they won D expedition of the year. So uh, it looks like you're you've got a nice resume of D expeditions. But let's talk about the big one coming up, Palmyra. Uh, Kilo 5 Palmyra. Now you're co-leading that one, right? Uh, I think the second we left Wake Island, he was already working on uh, this particular de -expedition. Actually, there's several people that were team members on the Wake Island, the K K9W de-expedition that have come forward with uh, opportunities. And Lou had been uh, working on going to Palmyra and actually another one that uh, we, I think that we're gonna be able to go to as well in, in the near future. And uh, this one was, came uh, right, uh, be, became available immediately after Navassa. In fact, we found out we could go while we were on Navassa Island, both Lou and I were on Navassa. And, uh, and we knew we had a, a very narrow window to get everything there because uh, as they always say, they're rare for a reason and there's not very much transportation to get to, to Palmyra. Uh, they have a, they had a barge leaving less than uh, five or six weeks after we were back from Navassa. So we hurried up and we loaded, got all the antennas, all the coax, all of the heavy things, and we got it to, to Honolulu and uh, Chemo, KH7U, uh, and got it on the barge for us, and it's already on Palmyra Island. And right now, actually, I'm preparing all of the, the computers and the Elecraft K3s, the KPA 500s, all of that stuff is uh, right outside here and I'm setting that up. <laughs> That's a cool picture. Uh, we've got a small area to operate. It's right down there. You can actually see where we're going to be. And uh, we're only allowed to be in one area. And of course you can understand the restrictions with fish and wildlife. The, Na the Nature Conservancy actually owns the one island called Collins Island. And you can see the runway that we're allowed to land on. That is actually a uh, U.S. Navy uh, airstrip from World War II uh, time frame, and uh, they've had a hard time keeping it clear. Um, but uh, we're there. In fact, they the, the runway is no longer certified, and they they're allowing only uh, two type of aircraft uh, on onto the island. So it's very restricted as to how to even get there. Um, there's five residents there right now um, that are doing research and maintenance on the island that'll be hosting us. And uh, there's our website. So if you'd like to help support the DX edition, in fact, we've received tremendous support, uh, support from all of the major foundations, the NCDX, uh, DXF, Indexa, and a lot of European foundations. Uh, the Japanese have supported us quite a bit. Um, but this is a top 10 uh, destination. You're welcome to go to the website and check it out. We'll be on all the bands. Uh, we're even taking a six meter antenna. We'll have a beacon running. And uh, we'll be on both CW and we'll, a phone and a radio teletype. So you have your choice and you can work us. We look forward to that. Now, when are you hoping to be on the air? What, what date is the dream Well, date January 11th, uh, we're supposed to arrive on the island and then we'll be in a hurry to set up everything. You know, we'll have to find all of the stuff that was shipped there and we'll have to unpack it, get it all set up. We got stepper antennas. It'll be very much similar to what they just did at uh, the Willis Island. Uh, where they set up a, a, quite a few steppers out on the front near the water. We also have a, uh, a BCS, a Battle Creek Special, that we'll put up for 160 and 80 meters. Um, and then we're taking a, a couple of high-powered amplifiers, some SPE uh, 1.3 uh, amplifiers that were just recently used on a couple of D expeditions as well. So uh, we should have good signals for everybody. Let's see propagation. propagation. Uh, uh, we Right now, with the, the sun the way it is, it's sometimes rather iffy and we hope well, fingers are crossed it will have really good conditions in january january is usually now, a pretty good month now, i know with the uh, runway condition that was going on you guys had to cut back on your operating list so how many operators are going now well right now we have 12 people on our team but they have cut back the plane to us we this was just happened 
the last 30 days to nine people. Um, we actually have a conference with them this week. Uh, hopefully we can get it back up to 12. There is another type of plane that they can land with 12 people. Um, and we're allowed 800 pounds of, uh, of uh, shipping, which would be the radios and the computers and that sort of thing, and our luggage. So we're really trying to get the 12, um, but uh, right, they called us about 30, 40 days ago and said, we're only, we can only get this one plane and it's got nine people on it. And of course, our, con our, our proposal with them, they actually presented it to us, was that they were gonna provide transportation for 12 people. So we're really disappointed, but um, I'm not surprised, I guh uh, Well, and I know that cuts into, uh, <laughs> uh, the more operators you get, the, the more you can defray the cost of it because the, these yes. operators pay a, a lot to get in on the de-expedition. So how much is the total cost of this de-expedition? Well, it runs right around $200,000. Um, it could run as high as $220,000 with all the shipping costs that might be incurred, but uh, we're hoping that we're on this side of that. Um, unfortunately, all of the costs have to be put in early or in front because uh, they, wouldn't even let it, they wouldn't even take us. So this is one of those where you pay everything in advance and the, every one of the operators has to pay their own transportation and their, their own stay but they, and they each put in $10,000 a piece. So that's $120,000, um, you know, over half the cost is uh, just by the team alone, but we've received substantial re support. Um, and I, we certainly, like I said, we certainly appreciate the early support because we can pay our bills. We wouldn't be able to go. And I know that there's uh, several other big D expeditions, Heard Island and the VP8 uh, group that, are, that have the same issues. In fact, they have bigger issues, they have bigger costs. And, uh, all the support everybody can put together now while we still have DX propagation is a great thing as the uh, sunspot cycle winds down.